Uh, well, thank you very much, Dom and Angela, for organizing this and inviting me here to have this opportunity to give you guys a, an update on some of the things we're doing in our attempt to manage cancer. Um, and I'll be talking uh, about some fundamentals uh, of the disease, and then I'll give you an update on some of our unpublished uh, work with mice uh, and with people. Um, so let me uh, go to the... Okay, this is, um, we always have a reality check, an update, what's going on in the world of cancer. Um, we have the latest that just came out, projections for 2016. I don't expect you to see the details of these numbers. I only want you to know they're big and they're getting bigger. All right? So we have the 2016, we have 1,632 people a day dying from cancer. We're not really sure how many of these people are dying from the cancer or from the treatments that they use to treat the disease. This is a, a very difficult question. And we also recognize now uh, that uh, brain cancer in children, pediatric brain cancer has replaced leukemia as the number one killer, uh, cancer killer for children. So this situation is not good and something has to be done. So we have a question, um, and this is a provocative question. Uh, that needs to be addressed uh, in relationship to the origin of the disease. I think if we better understand the origin of the disease, we will have a better chance at managing uh, and preventing the disease. All right, so is cancer a nuclear genetic disease or is it a mitochondrial metabolic disease? The question is weighted. Okay, is the disease resulting from defects in the nucleus of the cell or is it resulting from defects in the cytoplasm, and in particular, the mitochondria that we've heard a lot about at this meeting of the cell? This is a very important question because it will determine how we approach this disease with, but with respect to not only management, with, but, but with respect to prevention. All right, the current dogma, cancer is a genetic disease, and the hallmarks of cancer by Drs. Hanahan and Weinberg have solidified this over two uh, major papers in 2000 and 2001, some of the most highly cited papers in the field of cancer. Um, cancer cells carry the oncogenic and tumor suppressor mutations that define cancer as a genetic disease. A dogma is an irrefutable truth. It's a concept that is no longer challenged or investigated because a dogma is solid. And how do I know this is a dogma? How do we know that it's a dogma? When we teach general biology, cell biology, and biochemistry at the college level, and you look at the sections on cancer, cancer is a genetic disease. There's no other discussion about it. You go to the NCI website, cancer is a genetic disease. There's no discussion about this. This is a dogma. Now, they, here's the, 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 the foundation of the dogma is the somatic mutation theory, and that solidifies the dogma. And they use these simplistic diagrams, a car that has no brakes and the accelerator is, is maximally forward to replicate or to simulate what goes on in a population of cancer cells. Here these cells are out of control, cell division out of control. They have no brakes and their acceleration, their growth acceleration is out of control and you have this uh, situation. So out of control cell growth, dysregulated cell growth is the signature feature of this disease regardless of what tissue or organ it happens to attack. Then we place the hallmarks of the disease as Hanahan and Weinberg have done in this, these six major hallmarks, sustaining proliferation, evading growth, activating invasion and metastasis, enabling replicative immortality, inducing angiogenesis and resisting cell death, all the result of nuclear driven oncogenes and tumor suppressor genes. Now, in the most recent rendition of their paper, we, we now entered into emerging hallmarks, hallmarks that have not yet reached the big six. So this includes dysregulated cellular energetics and avoiding immune uh, destruction. In, if you read their paper in, in detail, it will, it will say dysregulated energetics is now considered an emerging hallmark that is programmed by proliferating inducing oncogenes, preserving the dogma, okay? This preserves the dogma because we're saying, okay, you can have this dysregulated energy metabolism, but the oncogenes are controlling it. Everybody's happy. <laughs> All right. Now, 
we have, here's another situation, normal chromosomes, normal cell. Now, all of a sudden, cancer arises from a series of uh, chance mutations in different genes in different places. And they say maybe for, we, nobody really knows how many genes are responsible for the origin of the disease. Some people say one, two, four. Uh, Michael St uh, Stratton and his group uh, predict that complete cancer genoming sequence will eventually identify 700 million mutations. All right, several, several, all these driver genes and passenger genes and all this kind of stuff. And they, now they're calling in uh, Watson, right, the IBM computer, down at MD Anderson. They try to figure out what's going on with all these genes. Good luck to that. <laughs> all right. Now here we have a person staring into a screen. Individuals' cancer cells are genetically tested for personalized therapy. She's going to look at these images and breast cancer cells being examined to see if they possess extra copies of a particular gene. And based on that genetic information, they're going to either make some sort of a prognosis or they're going to uh, elicit some sort of a therapy. And we know from President Obama's speech a couple of weeks ago, and he emphasized in his State of the Union speech, personalized therapy is the way we're going to manage this disease. And we're going to have the Honorable Joe, Joe Biden lead the charge. Now, I believe Joe Biden has a good heart. And I think because of the loss of his son to glioblastoma, he has an intrinsic interest to do something about managing cancer. The question is, is he going to receive the information related to the dogma, or maybe he might want to consider other options or other uh, possibilities? And this is what we don't yet know. Now, one of the most important things about cancer is metastasis. This is what ultimately kills almost all the people that have the disease, either, the de either that process itself or in the attempts to stop that process. This is a diagram here. You have the cancer cells. And they go through this cascade. It's a, it's a very stereotypical cascade, regardless of where the cancer comes from. If it comes from the lung, the colon, the breast, you know, the bladder, it goes through. The cancer cells invade. Okay, These green cells, are the, they break through the basement membrane and enter into the local tissue. Then they intravasate, enter into the circulation. These are very sophisticated biological processes by which this happens. They, uh, immune system su survival, OK? How come they're surviving the immune system? Isn't it? We'll come to that later on. But then they immunosuppress the immune system, and they extravasate. They leave the bloodstream and, 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 and enter and form these col distant colonizations, which make, means that you can't cut this out. They're spreading all over the place. So it becomes a very difficult disease. But this is a very stereotypical pattern. Now, according to the dogma, the epithelial mesenchymal transition is designed to explain this. Chance mutations happen in these cells. The, ch the cells through these chance mutations enter into the bloodstream. And then many of these effects of the chance mutations become reversed in some unknown way. And then they start uh, replicating uh, the way they were before they were actually entering into the bloodstream. Now, I don't know how a bunch of chance mutations could constantly produce a very stereotypical pattern. How do chance events cause a non-chance event? I don't know. Now, we have a problem. <laughs> how can we advance new metabolic therapies if the 800-pound gorilla thinks cancer is a genetic disease? And who is the gorilla? The National Cancer Institute academic and pharmaceutical cancer industries. All right? Dogma rules. If you want to come up with a new therapy, you better make sure it's, it's associated with dogma. Now, we can say we don't need to do that. And we can putz around here with these metabolic therapies, but they'll be always be on the periphery. They're not going to be mainstream until the gorilla unasses the room. Now, how are you going to do that? All right? You can just do it by continuing to do what many people in this room are doing, or you can try to undermine the dogma with the evidence that exists. And this is what I'm trying to do. Through the scientific argument, the scientific argument and the debate related to this disease. So let's look at the, ele the evidence that challenges the somatic mutation theory. OK, I'm going to go through a series of experiments that were done over the years that are inconsistent with the dogma. This work was done by Dr. McKinnell, who I had the opportunity to talk to at the University of Minnesota as a professor emeritus at the University of Minnesota. And he did these studies way back in 1969, where he had this a very aggressive renal tumor in the frog. Okay? 
It's a lethal uh, a malignant tumor. It fr comes from the kidney in the luck frog. What, what uh, Mc Dr. McKinnell did is he took the, the cell out of the, the tumor, removed the nucleus from the tumor, and put it into an uh, enucleated fertilized egg that had normal cytoplasm. So you take the, cell, the nucleus that has the tumor suppressor genes and the uh, abnormal oncogenes, defects, and you put it into a new cytoplasm, and he generated this tadpole, all right? There was no dysregulated cell growth in the tadpole. You could cut the tail off, the tail would grow back, and this, this thing. The problem is the tadpole never could mature into a fully uh, uh, differentiated mature frog. So there was something in that cancer nucleus that blocked development, but it certainly didn't cause the signature, meta, the, the signature defect, which is this proliferation. Findings are inconsistent with the somatic mutation theory. And then uh, Beatrice Mintz and Carla Menzi, leaders in the field of developmental biology, took cancer cells from a very malignant teratoma and put these whole cells into the blastocyst and developed a mouse that was a mixture of the tumor cell origin and the, and the, and the other origin. And the mouse was, was healthy except for a few little uh, uh, spots, but, their, but their, um, uh, their, their, their conclusion was conversion to neoplasia does not involve structural changes in the nuclear genome. Okay, well, what happened to the tumor suppressor and the oncogenes, right, if this, is, if this is the case? The findings are inconsistent with the somatic mutation theory. Uh, uh, Jim Morgan and his group from St. Jude's Medical Hospital in, in, in Memphis, Tennessee, uh, were studying medulloblastoma. It's a, uh, a very aggressive childhood uh, brain tumor in the cerebellum. Uh, they had knocked out a gene, patched, and they made these tumors. And they took the nucleus and, uh, of, the, of the medulloblastoma and they, and they put it into an embryonic uh, stem cell, and they, and they said, although medulloblastoma-derived embryos aborted, none exhibited uncontrolled proliferation resembling tumor genesis. What happened to the oncogenes and these tumor suppressor genes? Here's this embryo. Again, it aborted. Something is in those, the cancer nucleus that's blocking development, but it's not causing the signature phenotype, which is uh, uh, unbridled proliferation. They're inconsistent. This is work done by Rudy Anish at MIT and his group, where they took melanoma uh, tumors, characterized genetically the mutations that were in the melanoma, took the nucleus of the melanoma, put it into an embryonic stem cell, and cloned a mouse from the melanoma nucleus. Okay, the presence of major genetic abnormalities in the mice cloned from the tumor provides unequivocal genomic evidence that the mice were cloned from the tumor nucleus. Where is the dysregulated, what, uh, the mice aborted? Okay, just like the frog and, 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 just, and just like the medulloblastoma. Something in that cancer cell nucleus that's damaged is aborting development, but it's not causing the signature defect according to the dogma that you would have expected because the phenotype comes from the nucleus. Now, this is a very important paper by Benny Kirapatu from Baylor College of Medicine and, and his uh, group there. Now, Benny decided to look at the, what, let's not transfer the nucleus, let's transfer the mitochondria. So he took very aggressive breast cancer, highly malignant breast cancer cells, and he replaced the mitochondria in the breast cancer cells with uh, normal mitochondria, non-cancerous uh, non mitochondria. He characterized the upregulated oncogenes and the genetic abnormalities in the breast cancer from the malignant cells. He puts the mitochondria from the normal and the oncogenes turn off and the energy metabolism of the cell, and the cells stopped growing. And then when he did the reverse experiment, took the, the very cancerous mitochondria and put it into extremely slow-growing tumors, these tumors went, went, went berserk, and he grew them in the mice to show this. Okay, the mitochondria are calling the shots here. Now what I did just recently over the summer, I kind of bundled, I've only given you a small snapshot of some of these papers. You have to go and read all of this for yourselves. So what I did in this paper is I threw out the data and I said, let's interpret the data based on the, uh, the somatic mutation theory and based on the mitochondrial metabolic theory, and you come to the conclusion of what you think this is telling us. Because if it's, not, if it's telling us that this is not a nuclear genetic disease, then we have gone seriously off track, and it takes time to, 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 to look into this. So this little diagram that's circulating through the web that we, my students and I put together to give us a little picture of what's going on, in a very simplistic way, this figure, normal cells beget normal cells, tumor cells beget tumor cells. What is responsible for the dysregulated phenotype? Is it the defects in the nucleus or is it the defects in the cytoplasm in the mitochondria? You move the nucleus to a normal cell and you get normal cells, sometimes normal tissues, but it aborts. So there's something going on with this cancer gene. 
You do the reverse experiments, which have been done by uh, Israel and Schaefer, and you put a normal nucleus into a tumor, and you get, you get either tumor cells or dead cells. You don't get normal cells. Again, we're seeing evidence that challenges the dogma that cancer is a genetic disease. So, if somatic mutations are not the origin of cancer, then how do cancer cells arise? Big question. Okay, let's throw off the dogma. Okay, oh, now we're really, we're groping now. No, we're not groping. Warburg had it pegged a long time ago. Okay, a very dynamic uh, scientist from the 20th century. He clearly stated, cancer arises from damage to cellular respiration. And, and we saw this from, from Dr. Buss's uh, presentation yesterday. Energy through fermentation gradually compensates for insufficient respiration. Cancer cells continue to ferment lactate in the presence of oxygen, which is the Warburg effect. Big field of research in cancer metabolism. What is the, wh where does the Warburg effect come from? What controls the Warburg effect? Everybody's trying to figure out how the oncogenes, oncogenes do drive the Warburg effect, but why are the oncogenes up? Because they have defective respiration. Warburg also clearly defined the nature of the Warburg effect. That's not a mystery, regardless of what I, people say. Enhanced fermentation, now here's it. Enhanced fermentation is the signature metabolic defect, malady in all these cancer cells, to some degree or another. Some cancer cells, a little bit of respiration, some have very few respiration. But nevertheless, insufficient respiration is the common metabolic malady. malady. All right? Every cell in that tumor is a different genetic entity. They all have different genetic mutations. Every cell in the tumor, you clone them out, they're all different from each other. Why do we persist on focusing on the unique differences of every cell in the tumor looking for the, for the therapy when the common metabolic malady is, is, is sitting right there in front of us? Why we, don't, why we don't do that? Why don't we focus on the common defect rather than the unique defect in every single cell? Okay, very simplistic overview of energy metabolism. Most of our energy comes from oxidative phosphorylation in the mitochondria. Breathe in the good air, exhale, exhale the bad air. CO2 goes out from the foods that we bring in, we're respiring, or most of the energy in our body is coming from oxidative phosphorylation. Very little energy comes from substrate level, these are primitive forms of energy, substrate level phosphorylations. You get it in uh, the glycolytic pathway in, in the uh, cytoplasm, and also in the Krebs cycle, the citric acid cycle, you can get some energy through the succinyl-CoA synthase step in there, which can get upregulated in cancer. Okay, so what happens in the tumor cells now is there is a shift away from oxphos to these more primitive substrate level phosphorylations. This is seen a, to some degree or another. Okay, why is there a shift? Because if they don't make the shift, they're going to die. All right? If only cells that can upregulate substrate level phosphorylations can tolerate a loss in, in respiration, otherwise the cells die, you're never going to get cancer. So, a lot of people say, oh, there's nothing wrong with the mitochondria and tumors. Well, when you look at it under the electron microscope, you see often a lot of different kinds of problems. And we, and we just heard from John, th these are tubes. So these are tubes running through a syscytium uh, of this organelle. And this is the barrel orthodox shape of the, see these stripes here? These are the cristae. They contain the proteins of the electron transport chain and the lipid, cardiolipin, of the elect. These lipids and proteins work together and they form these super complexes to generate the energy that we need to respire ourselves and generate the energy for our body. This is a glioblastoma multiforme that we heard uh, about yesterday. And they have a ghost, what they call uh, crystallosis, leading to ghost mitochondria. Structure dictates function. The very structures are missing to a, to a large degree in the, in the mitochondria of the GBM and in the, in the mitochondria of a lot of cancers. Now, they're not all cancers don't look exactly like this. Some have massive numbers of mitochondria, but they're all dysmorphic in one way or another. Most cells have very few mitochondria in the cancer cells, but many of them have this. Pete Peterson at Johns Hopkins did a huge study. He never found a tumor cell that had completely normal numbers of structures of mitochondria. Mitochondria are defective. If these mitochondria are defective, these cells are not going to be able to respire. And in order for them to, to respire effectively, they're going to, have to, they're going to have to go back to some sort of level of fermentation. Otherwise, they're going to die. There's no other way you can get energy. We looked, at, we, we, we looked at all this, and there's a lot of evidence to show this. Now, the question is, how do you put all this together? If you're going to come up with a new kind of a view of cancer, you have to be able to link all of the information that's been done on this disease and then reinterpret it in light of a different kind of a, a view. 
the mitochondrial metabolic theory of cancer. Okay, so we take the emphasis away now from the nucleus and we put it on the mitochondria, all right? And this is the oncogenic paradox that has, per that has perplexed scientists for decades. Even in the book, The Emperor of All Maladies, Sudhuth Mukherjee's book, that was on the bestseller list, was struggling. You go and look, read his book, we don't understand how it's possible that we can have all these provocative agents from the environment causing cancer through a common pathophysiological mechanism. This challenged Albert St. Georgi, Nobel Prize winner. This challenged John Carnes. There's a variety of people. We don't understand how uh, uh, ca uh, carcinogens, radiation, hypoxia, inflammation, rare inherited mutations, P53. Oh, cancer must be a genetic disease because a person inherited the disease. Warburg said, you have many secondary causes of cancer. There's only one primary cause, the damage to the respiration. Those P53 mutations that you inherit in the genome damage the respiration, so does BRCA1 and some of these others that you hear about. RAS oncogenes, viruses, age, all of these things can produce cancer in various tissues. What do they do? They produce ROS, reactive oxygen species. ROS are known to be carcinogenic and mutagenic, all right? So they're coming out of the mitochondria and they're causing the genomic mutations that you see in the nucleus. They feed back and they cause further damage on the efficiency of the respiration. The, the, the mitochondria signal the nucleus if you're going to survive, we have to go to alternative energy. What's going to drive the alternative energy? The oncogenes, they're transcription factors for the fermentation pathways. So they're an effect, they're not the cause. It's very important to recognize this because it's extremely important on how we're going to deal with this disease if we understand the origin. So what happens then, this is a progressive situation. It's an escalation of biological chaos, eventually leading to these ghost mitochondria, eventually shifting from ROS, from from oxidative phosphorylation to substrate level phosphorylation. So the cell now becomes more and more fermentative during the progression of the cancer genome is, is all shot to hell. It's collecting all these mutations. You get a Warburg effect, which is the shift for the fermentation. Now we can begin to link this, the, the hallmarks of cancer to defective respiration and this whole shift from, from respiration to fermentation. So th th when you damage the cell's respiration, the mitochondria are keeping those cells in a differentiated state. When that mitochondria becomes dysfunctional, the cells begin to ferment. When the cells ferment, they begin to take on the characteristics that organisms had on the planet before oxygen came in, all right? So during that time when there was no oxygen in the atmosphere, all of the cells were highly fermentative in a highly reduced state and proliferated uncontrollably, all right? In a, in a, in a unbridled proliferation. Okay, if that's the case, then you can account for the three major, the first three major concepts of the whole. All of this is the result of these cells returning to their to primitive state. Sustained angiogenesis, vascularization of the tumor, the every, massive e emphasis going on this. The cells are blowing out lactic acid into the microenvironment, creating an acidification, which is telling the, the body to, this is a wound, we gotta go and, and heal this. The, va the blood vessels come in, it's coming in because of the destabilized energy metabolism in those cells. They evade apoptosis. Okay, what controls apoptosis? Cytochrome C in the mitochondria. Mitochondria are being blown out, therefore these cells are escaping their normal program death. Now this is the, the big dog here, metastas metastasis. All right, how do we link, how do we link the metabolic theory, uh, uh, the mitochondrial metabolic theory, into the most important aspect of cancer? There is growing appreciation that the metastatic cell is a fused hybrid from our immune system with these tumor cells. This is not well appreciated because it's not consistent with the epithelial mesenchymal transition of the dogma, but there's a growing evidence. So we have normal cells, we have a beginning a dysplastic carcinoma in situ. These cells now begin to throw out a little lactic acid. Our macrophages of the immune cells come in as facilitators of wound healing. And when the wound doesn't heal and this chronic condition persists over time, to, to facilitate wound healing, the macrophages fuse with these cells. So in the fusion process, these cells are now picking up dysfunctional mitochondria from, the, from, these, from these cells that cannot and can, do not metastasize. These cells, these, this condition, these fused hybrids now, the macrophages live in the circulation. They enter and exit, extravasate, intravasate. There are militia in our body to heal uh, bacterial infections, help fa facilitate wound healing. These cells are all pr already programmed to do all of the things in the metastasis cascade. 
You don't have to have new mutations. As a matter of fact, some of the most metastatic cells have no mutations. I don't know how the dogma deals with that. The other thing you have to realize that as a cell of the immune system, glutamine now becomes a major fuel in addition to glucose. Our immune cells are glutamine hogs. That's because of their biology and what they're programmed to do. So it's very important then to recognize that what we have done is unleashed a beast that is metabolically uh, dysregulated. So if most cancers express the Warburg effect as the result of impaired respiratory, what are the therapies? Okay, now let's look at the therapies. Okay, and once we have a clear, a more clear understanding of the nature and the biology of what cancer actually is, now we can begin to think about those kinds of therapies that might be more effective or uh, 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 better than what we presently have. Okay, one strategy is to reduce levels of fermentable fuels while elevating levels of non-fermentable fuels. If fermentation is what's keeping those guys alive, we need to recognize that and deprive them of the fuels that are allowing them to grow. Okay, so let's look at the metabolism. Glucose and glutamine are the prime fermentable fuels for this cell. These cells are living in hypoxic environments. Okay, glucose comes in as glucose 6-phosphate can be metabolized through the Emden-Meyerhoff pathway, getting us nice a subst lot of substrate, a lot of energy through the glycolytic pathway, blowing out lactic acid into the microenvironment. Also, some of the, some of the pyruvate can enter into the, the citric acid cycle, come out as citrate for the synthesis of lipids using the other part of the pathway, the pentose phosphate pathway, which is upregulating glutathione, keeping these cells from dying from the ROS. This glutathione is upregulated in these cells. They, they use NADPH, which is also a substrate for building fatty acids. So you're getting, and of course, you're building the precursors for DNA synthesis. So these cells can proliferate using glucose as the substrate. On the other side, you get glutamine coming in, split by the glutaminase. The amide nitrogen is now coming in and now forming the two major, con nitrogen and carbons are gonna make the DNA and the RNA and all this the proliferation. The uh, glutamate can be dumped back out into the out, outside which in the brain is deadly because it's gonna create uh, excitotoxic death and, and necrosis, and it's gonna facilitate rapid growth. Or the glutamate can be transaminated to alpha-ketoglutarate using either a, the, the, a, the uh, reductive pathway or the oxidative pathway, either one, to generate more substrates for the growth of the cell. So glutamine and glucose, now, if, uh, and as Angela's gonna talk about, if you shut down the glucose and you starve them of this, and then you give them a hyperbaric oxygen, you could potentially overwhelm their antioxidant capacity and kill them naturally by upregulating uh, uh, reactive oxygen species. And the ketones from the ketogenic diets will protect normal cells from this, from this attack. So this is the thing. Everybody's always interested. Can we get a drug that's gonna kill tumor cells and not hurt? So far, that drug doesn't exist, but it can. Okay, calorie restriction, metabolic cancer intervention. We've heard about this. Total dietary restriction differs from starvation and the fact that it maintains minerals and nutrients, enhances mitochondrial biogenesis. That some of these cancer cells that might be on the threshold could potentially be returned to the society of cells if you could re reactivate their mitochondria, not poisoning uh, 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 individuals to reactivate that mitochondria. All right, so we have reduced, now if we go into calorie restriction, blood sugar goes down, insulin goes down, glucagon turns on, we heard about this yesterday. Okay, we start mobilizing fats, water-soluble breakdown fat products, beta-hydroxybutyr acetone blows out in the breath. Okay, so we begin to shift the whole metabolic environment by doing calorie restriction. Now, let's look at some of the data from some of our, now this is a study we did using the Ziegler Brothers zero carbohydrate ketogenic diet, uh, standard diet, ketogenic diet, unrestricted, let the mice eat all they want, and restricted, calorie restricted to reduce body weight by about 15%. Now, look at this. Standard diet, unrestricted, tumors grow fast. You restrict the, the high-carbohydrate diet, the tumors grow slow. You, now here, the ketogenic diet, unrestricted, makes the tumors grow even faster. The ketogenic diet, you have to know how to use it. It's a, it's a tool. If you don't know how to use it, you, get, you can have problems. You restrict the diet, yes, you get this. Now we saw the same effects using nutritious KetoCal, the same, same exact findings from the, from, but I wanna say, not all these ketogenic diets are the same. All right, some, some you can eat ad libitum, I'll show you data for that, where you, don't, where you don't get necessarily something like this, so there's some differences here. And also some of the tumors respond differently. That's another thing. What we did, each one of these mice are a diff, uh, under a different diet condition, and we use linear regression analysis. As glucose goes down, ketones go up, an evolutionarily conserved adaptation. 
as glucose goes down, tumor weight goes down, and we heard that yesterday from Dr. Bass. There's a direct correlation in the blood between how fast your tumor grows and how much blood sugar you have. And that's, we showed this in the mouse, and now it's been shown for breast cancer and for brain cancer and for a variety of other things. Now, what are the mechanisms? People love to know the mechanism. I'm not gonna have time to go through all of our massive amounts of data, but uh, calorie restriction targets multiple cancer hallmarks. It downregulates the vas vascular endothelial growth factor expression for angiogenesis. It operates through the NF-kappa B pathway, downregulating uh, those signaling cascades. It's pro-apoptotic. It's killing the tumor cells by an apoptotic mechanism. So now what we've done the mechanisms in the mice, and we've done a lot of work like this. Um, of course, uh, we want to look at brain cancer. We've done a lot of work on brain cancer. We've developed a very excellent model for human glioblastoma. Um, the, and this GBM model it fulfills all of the characteristics that you see in human GBM. Uh, this is one of our first slide studies on just calorie restriction alone. Um, here's the brain. You put the, these are dark cells here. These are the tumor cells. And as Dr. Boss said yesterday, these cells invade, right? We these cells, you put the cells here, they'll invade right across the corpus callosum. They'll go to the brain stem. They'll go to the cerebellum. These cells are all out through the brain. There's no way you're going to be able to surgically resect or debulk this. However, we put the mice on calorie restriction, and you can see that the uh, demarcation of the tumor becomes much sharper under calorie restriction. And as Dr. Boss said yesterday, we know that if you, the more you can debulk on a cancer patient, the, greater, the longer that person is going to live. If, so I say, why, why, you know, when a person has the brain tumor, they go, oh, we've got to get the brain tumor out right away. Why don't you put them on a calorie-restricted ketogenic diet, shrink the tumor, and then take the tumor out, and you're going to, you're going to guarantee that the patient's going to live longer. For some, of, for some reason, as soon as the poor patient gets dying, oh, we've got to take that tumor out right away. It's just like, what, the poor guy doesn't even know what's going on. You know, nor does the neurosurgeon most of the time. <laughs> Except for the ones at, at U Pitt. Joe Maroon, all right? Can the ketogenic diet be effective in the metabolic management of, of brain cancer in people? Okay, the first study was done by Linda Nemling. Uh, she took two little kids that were failing the standard of care, and uh, they were not responding, and she put them on the ketogenic diet, low, uh, reduced blood sugar, elevated ketones, and they had a remarkable recovery. The quality of life of those kids improved significantly. Now, the way you're going to see, I, want, I cannot uh, uh, emphasize more, get her PhD dissertation from the, the library at Case Western and read how she dealt with this incredible challenge. It, when you read what, what happened to those little kids, it breaks your heart what, what those kids went through. And to see how they recovered and their quality of life improved with this ketogenic diet, one kid lived another couple of years. The other one was lost to follow-up. We, they, they, we, we tried to figure it out. We just, they couldn't figure out. Maybe, maybe the child is still alive. We don't know. But it was lost to follow-up. Now, what I don't understand is this was shown back in 95. It, it works. Why are we not using this in pediatric oncology? You know, we have some of the greatest minds here using the same therapy for epilepsy. Children in, with epilepsy are being treated with these ketogenic diets but little kids with brain tumors are not. What is going on with that? Okay, we published the second paper, uh, as you saw yesterday, um, in Nutrition and Metabolism, from this individual that was 65 years old, and she had a memory loss. And you saw the data, I'm not going to show you again, but Dr. Boss showed it yesterday. The tumor was shrunk, MRI, PET scans, everybody was quite excited, called radiological resolution. Doesn't happen often, it can happen occasionally on standard of care but it doesn't happen often. Were, we got several more positive signs. The, the individual thought they were out of the woods. They went back uh, off the diet. The tumor returned, okay? And rather than going back on the diet, they went on Avastin, all right? I've written about Avastin. Worst damn drug. It was taken off the market for breast cancer. Why are we still using it for brain cancer? It causes the cells to diffuse through the brain. You're never gonna, this is, oh, because the images look a little bit better. Okay, and we saw this, we published this in Lancet Oncology originally, and this is the standard of care. We're not going to make any major advances until we get rid of that standard of care. I don't care what anybody says. You create a perfect storm of metabolic abnormalities in the brain. You saw it yesterday. We're releasing glutamine in large quantities into the brain. We're trying to stem it by using high-dose dexamethasone. This is increasing glucose. Many of these brain tumors are infected. 
with the human cytomegalovirus. This is like a supercharger for using glucose and glutamine. All right? So we got a big problem here. And there's mycoplasma in those tumors. Not all, but some. We got all this crap in there. And we're freeing up the fuels that are going to keep those cells alive and, 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 and save them and, and facilitate their growth. Now, let's look at the, how it works. Stop, this is the standard of care. Radiation alone. None of the people survived. They all died. Now, temozolomide was considered the breakthrough. I was at the meeting when temozolomide was said, oh, this is the, this is the, this is the we get, we're, we're increasing progression-free survival by a significant amount if we combine temozolomide with radiotherapy. Then a paper comes out, temozolomide increases driver mutations. This was out from Dr. Johnson's group at UCSF. What's going on? How are you taking temozolomide, which is helping the patients live a little bit while progression-free, and at the same time, they're, 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 they're getting driver mutations. What's going on? How do, you, how do you explain this on the dogma? Okay, what are the adverse effects of temozolomide? Diarrhea, fatigue, nausea and vomiting in some patients. Those are all indirect forms of calorie restriction. Now, what would happen if we replaced temozolomide with a calorie-restricted ketogenic diet, something like uh, Adrian Sheck is doing? Do you think we could get a better, a better if we're combining or radiation with a restricted ketogenic diet, there's evidence to say that's true. What happens if we get, radi get rid of radiation altogether? God forbid! <laughs> the hospitals will lose their money! <laughs> All right, I'm going to give you an update on an individual that we've been working with uh, for several years now. This person presented with gait disturbance at age 56. Uh, they were given her flippers to improve her swimming and, you know, ex uh, biking and all this kind of stuff. Didn't go away, she was dying tumor, inoperable diffuse infiltrative brainstem glioma. Uh, in 2012, she initiated a restricted ketogenic diet with supplements, metformin, dichloroacetate, and curcumin. She had to get off the DCA after a while because it was causing some peripheral, peripheral neuropathy conditions. She w uh, w went to see five major medical hospitals in Europe and the United States, uh, refused recommended chemo and radiotherapy from five major medical centers. So she's not on any standard of care except the ketogenic diet and supplements. I talked to her last week. The tumor, the tumor can, MRI says the tumor's not going away. It grows very, very slowly. It's still there. But she still drives a car. She's in relatively good health, but she's depressed. I told her, stop getting the MRIs. Every time you get the MRI, you get depressed. All right? She's already out. <laughs> She's six years out. You know, um, this diffuse, and if you have little children have it, it's devastating. They die very quickly, unfortunately. But if you're in mid-years, you can live maybe 10 or, 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 or 15 uh, years with this kind of a tumor. But then it gets bad again when you get over, over age 55. In, in the literature, we know she's out now almost six years, or going on seven years uh, with this tumor. And as we know of only one other person, at least presented in the liter literature, at least that we know of that lived to nine years. So she's out in the stratosphere of survival without any standard of care. Now, we try to, we learned a lot from this one case. And, you know, we're trying to uh, 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 elevate ketones and reduce glucose. But each one of these is the, the, measure, the measurements every day measuring glucose and ketones over months. So we have hundreds and hundreds of measurements of glucose and ketones in this one person. Now, the problem, of course, is that you see a lot of scatter. We're trying to develop a, 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 a procedure that can be used in clinical trials and things like this. And my students and I are looking at the data and we're going, man, this is going to be tough to do in a clinical, how are these people? And then, you know, she, uh, she goes out and gets into, she has a handicapped parking spot. She goes into some, some guy's parked in her handicapped parking spot. And the next thing you know, she has a big her blood sugar. And I think Colin Champ went on the web showing how, how emotional stress and all these things can do this. All right. So we developed the, the glucose ketone index as a, as a, as a biomarker to help uh, uh, evaluate this. You get the ratios. And we replotted her data, and now it looks much more, more, much more stable. And we think this is going to be an effective way to do this. I also want to say that um, uh, we're going to try to validate in, in our GBM model. And the GBM, people say it doesn't metastasize. That's true. It doesn't rarely come out of the brain. But if you take those cells and humans, if human cells can get outside the brain, they spread through the whole, the whole mouse just like this. So this is Mrs. GBM outside the brain, and it's been reported. And we have, uh, so we, we can bioilluminesce the tumor cells. You can see the liver full of cancer, uh, spleen as well. So what we did, this is our new unpublished study. Um, Look at how beautiful the body weights are. 
Now, this is a ketogenic diet, ketogen, that uh, the mice do lose weight a little after a while. So it's the one that Dominic and Angela, we all use. We keep the body weights really tight. Standard unrestricted, restricted ketogenic diet, unrestricted. Glucose is high in the unrestricted groups and low in the restricted groups. Look how high the ketones go when you restrict the ketogenic diet. If you can get those ketones up, they'll be toxic to the tumor cells. Sure, they go up if you eat ketogenic diet all, but they, but they won't go up as high unless you restrict, and the GKI is the lowest. And here's the results. Now, uh, you can see that um, uh, standard diet restricted had no effect in this tumor, in this tumor, because we think it's using glutamine. And now, ketogenic diet restricted had the best effect, and the unrestricted uh, replicates what Dominic and Angela found. Yes, there is some effect. But the best effect is when you restrict the diet. The important thing is the blood sugar here and here is the same, but the therapeutic benefit is much greater in the restricted diet. We did a linear regression analysis. As, uh, as the key, glucose ketone index goes down, survival of the mice goes up. So it validates that this GKI could be effective. We also know that 25% of brain cancer patients die from metastasis to the brain. The restricted diet significantly reduces metastasis to the brain. The problem is that uh, these tumor cells are mutated. Um, these, these mutated tumor cells will not be able to uh, adjust to rapid shifts in dietary conditions. Calorie restricted diets and restricted raw vegan diets, one or the other, putting on the press. The pulse are drugs, hyperbaric oxygen procedures, non-toxic drug targeting for glucose and glutamine. Most of what we're talking about so far is targeting glucose and elevating ketones with the hope that we're going to stop this disease. We've got to hit that glutamine. If we don't take care of the glutamine, we're not going to be completely successful. And this is a problem. It's so much more difficult to target glutamine than it is to target glucose. Conclusions. Cancer is more of a mitochondrial metabolic disease than it is a nuclear genetic disease. And until this becomes more widely known and recognized, we're going to, be, we're going to see those numbers go up. The body count is going to go up. Preclinical and case report studies indicate that restricted diets can be effective non-toxic metabolic therapy for managing malignant cancers in children and adults. The GKI index can predict the success of, a metabol of metabolic therapy for cancer. I'd like to thank all of my many collaborators um, that are here, Angela and Dominic and Joe Maroon uh, and Jeff Boss re replaced him to, on, this, on the schedule. The, the funding agencies, uh, my, own my own institution, uh, George Yu Foundation, who's very interested in this, Travis Christofferson's Single Cause, Single Cure Fund Foundation. So these are the small organizations that are helping us continue to do this because I am, I am convinced that we will be successful in managing cancer without toxicity. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. I appreciate that. Any questions? Yes, yeah, Susan. Yeah, so I think I'll um, bring this up publicly. So a good friend of mine has glioblastoma right now that has recurred. And after I found out that she had it, I told you I flew out to Colorado. I brought her a new book. I brought her a bunch of materials. I highlighted the important things. I gave her a little simple instruction manual. But of course, she was doing well. She had just had a tumor removed. And anyway, so I said, well, you may need this at some point. Well, just last week, um, I found out that she had had another surgery because the tumor has recurred, et cetera. Um, and so one question I have is, do you know if it's at all possible that she could survive this at this point? Now that the tumor, tumor has recurred, they did in, intraoperative genetic testing of the cells, and of course they're infiltrated, etc. I mean, I don't think there's any hope, but I'm just wondering if you know. Well, you know, hope, um, we never say there's no hope. Right. Um, we know people who have gone, who had advanced cancers, who went on this. We, we, uh, we don't cure. Uh, but we give a higher quality of life. I would say not we, the, the, the metabolic therapy, if done correctly, can give people a longer period of time at a higher quality of life. 
I don't think it's possible to stop this tumor at that stage with, with, a, with a ketogenic diet alone. Uh, if they're going to do hyperbaric oxygen, you have to have that, uh, that, that, ha that has to be in a, in a high ketosis state, and it's a little risky, because it, but it can work. Um, at this advanced stage, Andrew uh, um, Scarborough is showing it. We have other people that are showing it. I think Mindy Elwell had some very good success with this. Um, there's always hope. Uh, we're not saying we can cure, but we can certainly delay. Until we can knock out that glutamine, uh, I don't think we're going to be able to cure this disease. But if we had a drug, which we don't yet have, that could work, I think the, uh, the hope and, and the prognosis would be much better. Okay, thank you. So my main point for bringing this up publicly is I've had a lot of success in my community with various community activism, and they often start with petitions. So what I'm planning on doing is writing now a letter to all of our doctors. And I'll provide a copy of it maybe someplace at the dinner tonight. And I'm thinking whoever wants to could sign it, maybe supporting her trying this um, ketogenic diet, maybe in combination with hyperbaric oxygen, at least as an adjuvant to, to whatever they're going to try to put her in on now. The problem is, is with cancer, because there's millions of things, there's always some new drug. And it seems like the doctors are always led along by the promise of some new drug that came out last month and maybe provides a different alternative. But I don't see you know, Susan, the, 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 the person themselves, that individual, has to make this decision, okay? That, that person, okay? And that's the way it's gonna change. Yeah, I know, because you know, sometimes we do all we can, and if the person is not there, it, it just, it just that, there's a commitment, there has to be an understanding. These are very difficult, everyone is a unique case. You know, the family has to be involved because the whole family has to participate. They're all misguided. They're what? They're, well, they're misguided, um, and there's an institutional barrier to this. So this is a tough. This is a very tough situation. Right. Well, I just feel like if I know. I the information, then I've done all I can. I think you have. Um, outstanding talk as always. Uh, you've been arguing against the oncogene of dogma for years, uh, very effectively. Has there been a response from the gorilla in the room, the oncogene <laughs> folks? Uh, I mean, either publicly when you've given a talk at a conference or in the literature? You know, the, um, have you ever been to Nikko, Japan? No. The monkeys, hear no evil, speak no evil, see no evil? <laughs> That's what you get. You've been ignored? Is that what you're saying? There's been absolutely no response whatsoever? Well, there's, been, there's behind the door response. All right. That, that, uh, we, we know about, yeah, maybe Travis can tell you about the behind the door response on this. But, you know, you're threatening a, a whole establishment here. I mean, let's be honest. You know, uh, what, what do you think? They're all going to run out in the streets and say, hey, yeah, let's drop our, our new Optivo on our commercial, putting it on the wall of the Sears trade, the, the Sears building in Chicago? I mean, this is, these, you, you, this is a big problem. But I'll tell you, there's ways to get around it with, with global budgeting. Uh, there's a financial incentive to do some of this under the Obamacare or some derivation of that um, that might, in fact, the, the Democratic, uh, the, the, the poor Democrat who doesn't get anything from, from Baltimore there. I saw him on the debate the other day. I don't know what, even know what his name is. He's always behind the other two, you know. But he actually, he actually said we're using this kind of a therapy or this kind of a, of a strategy. And I found that, whoa, maybe we should look at that guy a little, a little more. I don't, what's his name there, the guy from Baltimore? O'Malley, yes. Maybe we should take another look at Mr. O'Malley. Okay. <laughs> um, I'm also from, uh, from uh, you say. So, uh, have you talked about metabolic water being a, an important part of the strain? Because, um, to my uh, reading, is um, the, the, the main function, the primary function of my economy is to produce water. Now, what we do, what it does with the water, we can keep continuing, like, to manifest to produce ATP, or without drinking water, supplying so just to try the body with water, and that's how animals survive in the desert. And of your excellent uh, approach, I would just like to hear what you think. I, you know, I think it's an extremely important issue. It may work corollarily with the diet. I haven't tried it. I would love to try it. These are some of the things that if we had the money, we could do. You, got, we, you know, that's the problem. And as Adrian and I have know, 
Is it easy to get money for this, Adrian? Oh, a piece of cake. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's the situation. <laughs> Just a uh, very nice talk as usual. Uh, one quick comment. We do have an IRB approved clinical trial using the ketogenic diet up front. And the way we got that, our physicians are, are pretty good. I sit on to your board and they were not willing to go clinical trial based on our preclinical work until two patients, and you mentioned one of them in the well. Uh, said that they wanted to go on the diet based on publications they had seen and a couple intelligent families and went out there and stuff. Um, and they did so well that the clinicians in our institute went, well, maybe we should do it. And that's how the clinical talk got done. Exactly the same thing happened in epilepsy. It wasn't the physicians that pushed it. It was the patients and the patient's parents and the patient's kids that pushed it. So I think that that's where really the power is. Thanks to the epilepsy expo, epilepsy community, we know that the ketogenic diet is very safe. So our physician said, well, it's not going to hurt you. I'm not sure it's going to help, but it's not going to hurt you. So yeah, sure, you know, whatever. And then they did really well. So it really is the patients that are going to push this and the clinical trials that are going to give um, scientifically vetted data so that more clinicians can work. I agree, and I want to thank you for the work that you've done at, that, at the Barrows because you've been an instrumental force in, in, in pushing this forward. Thank you. Can you tell me who she is? That's Adrian Sheck, Barrows, uh, oh, yeah, Barrows Neurological Center in, in Phoenix, Arizona. Um, thank you very much for the very provocative uh, talk. Um, I have an AA2, uh, well, AA3 um, anaplastic astrocytoma, and I find that there's a lot of information about, about how to manage glioblastoma your work and others, uh, but there's not very much discussion about um, AA2 or AA3 uh, you know, information. So uh, from the information that you just presented, uh, the, is there a significant difference in how you would manage an AA2 or an AA3 to prevent uh, recurrence or more proliferation? Um, no, I, I think we would use the same strategy, uh, basically. Um, the, those have, you have a lot more to, Play, play around time. Uh, the, the tumors grow much slower. So, so the issue is can you make them grow even slower? And if you can get them even to a slower growth, can we move in with uh, hyperbaric oxygen and certain drugs that will work synergistically with the diet to kind of polish those, those cells off? So, you know, um, that's my strategy. That's what I would do. But as I want to say, this is an ex we're in a very infant stage of this procedure. We're at the very beginning of this new phase of, of, of managing cancer, and there's things that we don't yet know. And we learn a lot from just single patients and how they respond and the data that we get back from them. So, but, but you can, we can definitely, I think, I don't want to say for sure we don't know anything until we, until we actually get the data, but we can slow those tumor cells down, and then we would work through a, str a strategy to keep them under control. Perhaps we can spend a little bit of time outside of this. One of our two patients had an incomplete resected grade three tumor. And because it was completely resected, the clinicians expected it to continue to grow. And she's one of the two that changed my clinician time because the KD held it in base so well. It was a great three. Okay, so, sorry, just I'll make a, uh, a statement about my own condition, but uh, I had gone through standard of care and I found out about the ketogenic diet uh, during the follow-on uh, chemo. and. When I went through follow-on chemo, I actually saw a reduction in my brain tumor size to the point now where it's not perceivable on the scans. So obviously, I have a messed up brain. Uh, you also discussed the Bastin. Uh, I have a very good friend who has a GBM. He's a five-year survivor. Uh, he had two recurrences of his brain tumor uh, in very quick order. Uh, after uh, finding the ketogenic diet, uh, he actually had a, re a reduction of his uh, tumor size and, is, and basically is uh, not detectable on scans. And that's a G GBM to recurrence survivor. So it, it really does have a profound effect. Yeah, well, we want to make sure it works better. You know, that, that's, that's the, uh, this is the good first step, but the idea is can, we, can, can you come back in 25 years and say, you know, one time when I was a young man, I had this tumor. Yeah, you know. I 
<laughs> yeah. Yes. To actually approach this therapy because people uh, actively discourage it, um, you know, even though it, it is unlikely to hurt me. Right, right. Well, good luck to you and, you, and thank you for sharing that with us. Thanks for your talk, I really appreciate it. My question is about the calorie restricted component theory. To me, anyway, you showed a very dramatic difference between the ketogenic and the ketogenic calorie restricted diet. How do you measure that? How is it estimated, implemented? I mean, not all the details, but do you do you know, 75% of the metabolic index or? Yeah, no, it, we, we, we had to struggle with that for a long time, uh, basing it on, because calorie, we just heard about the calories last night, about their different metabolic effects. We use body weight. Body weight is the, is the uh, independent variable. We, we restrict both groups, whether, regardless of what they're eating, we make sure that they have exactly the same body weights. And that gives us a clear indication of what's, of what's working or not. So it's, we use it because the, bo the body is the bomb calimeter. The body tells you what you're going to burn. And the, and the mice they have a regulated uh, body weight. So if, and that's how we learned. Uh, if you calorie restrict a ketogenic diet based on, 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 on calories, and you give the same amount of isocaloric, the body weights are very different. They're eating isocaloric diets, but their body weights are different. What's going on with that? We know, we've heard all this. this, this so you make sure they have the same body weight, and then you can very uh, uh, see which one is working. So we use body weight. Thank you. This is great talk uh, Follow-up on from Mrs. Maranda. We have two IRB protocols for per GBM. Uh, one for terminal GBM, for one with the recurrence, and one for the nuance of treatment GBM. Uh, and I'd like to comment on the curve restriction. Uh, our protocols call for 1,600 calories of the restriction. I think that uh, in the case that he published, that was for his mother, the restriction was maybe 700 calories a day, uh, which I think is not sustainable. Uh, we uh, have made it 1,600 calories, which is sustainable, and we have found that uh, that it does lead to weight loss, but it is a clinical problem in patients who are not overweight and obesity starving, uh, because they do lose weight and they do find that uh, they and their families and their physicians plan to have the calories increase. Uh, so you're absolutely right. The, the, that's why we have to manage this disease quickly. All right, these diets are not—they're very hard to sustain into years. So we we have to do this. Weight loss will always. This is a weight loss diet. I mean, we have all these guys out here telling us about all this stuff. I mean, you're losing weight. Uh, it's a therapeutic weight loss, but we ha but we don't like uh, Trudy there. She had to get off the diet to regain the weight. All right, but you can shift from one kind of a diet to the other kind of a diet to try to maintain the weight. And you're absolutely right. When we did the published paper, we didn't know, all right? We were based on a powerful calorie restriction, but you're absolutely right. You can get the same results with much less calorie restriction, as long as you can keep the ketones as high as you can get them, all right? So you're, you're absolutely right. This is why we have to fine tune the system. Uh, the, the other one is that uh, regards the uh, uh, recruitment and uh, perception of the diet. Uh, we get lots of inquiries and very little recruitment. Uh, few, uh, many patients are interested, few sign on. Uh, and part of that is the fact that their decision making is not being supported by their oncologists and uh, surgeons. Uh, you know, it's not that they're not being, the surgeons and their, they're not trained. This, they don't get this training in their medical education. Okay, you're taking a, somebody who's been trained, highly, highly skilled professional, and they've never heard of this stuff. What's going on with the training program there, yeah. right? Why are they not getting that as a major course instead of learning about how, how temozolomide is going to uh, be used or one of these other drugs? So that has to change, okay? Who writes the curriculum for the medical schools? Okay, who's doing that? Figure out what, okay, let's change the curriculum. We do it at the university all the time. The core curriculum is always changing based on what's going on in the world. You, you see how he asked for an honor course on met metabolism and leukemia condition and mitochondrial disease. I, I said that. Yeah, well, maybe that's needed more. So you, you, you will be invited to Got to make sure where I'm going, you know. <laughs>